good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's session of the Washington History Seminar, Historical Perspectives on International and National Affairs. And this afternoon, we focus on a new book by Claire Rydell Arsenis entitled America's Philosopher, John Locke in American Intellectual Life, published by the University of Chicago Press last summer. Our discussants this afternoon are Leslie Butler of Dartmouth College and Holly Brewer of the University of Maryland. I'm Eric Arneson from the George Washington University, co-chair of the seminar. My colleague, Christian Osterman of the Woodrow Wilson Center can't be with us today. The seminar is a collaborative and nonpartisan venture of the Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program and the American Historical Association. And for over the past decade, the seminar had been meeting weekly in pre-COVID times in person at the Wilson Center. And since the pandemic and now in the post-pandemic era, we remain in the virtual realm. A few FYIs before we get started. First, today's session is sponsored by the American Historical Association. Second, please take note, our next seminar, next week on Monday, focuses on Melvin Leffler's just published book, Confronting Saddam Hussein, George W. Bush, and the Invasion of Iraq. That session will be a hybrid one. If you're in the DC area and you can attend in person, great, please do so. And if you can't, well, you can view it online. Third, as always, we'd like to recognize two people whose behind the scenes efforts make the seminars possible. Pete Bierstecker of the Wilson Center and Rachel Wheatley of the American Historical Association. And on the logistics front, please note today's session is being recorded and can soon be found on our institution's respective websites. When we get to the question and answer section of the webinar, we ask those of you with questions to use the raise hand function. That's our preferred method. That way you get to pose the question directly or you could use the Q&A function on Zoom, in which case I get to pose the question on your behalf. We'll call on as many folks as we can. And with those preliminaries out of the way, let's get the seminar fully underway. It's now my pleasure to introduce this afternoon's author, Claire Rydell Arsenis, an associate professor of history at the University of Montana, who studies the transatlantic intellectual, cultural, and political exchange between late 17th and mid 20th centuries. She's the recipient of numerous grants and fellowships, including awards from the National Endowment for the Humanities and the National Academy of Education Spencer Foundation. She's currently at work on several projects that explore the transatlantic history of utilitarianism, the history, crises, and the humanities, and interpretations of the American founding documents from the late 18th century to today. At the moment, she is in Oxford. You can see the beautiful Oxford Mountains uh, on her uh, screen uh, behind her. Uh, and today she'll be speaking on her new book, America's Philosopher, John Locke in American Intellectual Life. Claire, welcome to the Washington History Seminar. Thank you so much for the introduction, Eric. I'm delighted to be here talking with all of you. And I'm grateful to everyone watching, especially to Holly and Leslie uh, for engaging in this conversation about my recent book. I'd like to begin today uh, with the character Ron Swanson from Parks and Recreation, which I should probably acknowledge is not something that typically happens at the Washington seminar. But Swanson is important for me in ways that I'll explain momentarily. So in season three of Parks and Recreation, the popular 2010s NBC sitcom, a young girl on a school field trip wanders into Ron Swanson's city hall office in their small town of Pawnee, Indiana. The girl asks Ron, who's director of the local Parks and Rec Department, if she can interview him about the workings of local government in Pawnee. Ron, who has Hollywood's archetypal libertarian, despises all things government related, seizes on the opportunity to teach the young student a lesson as the audience cringes wondering what he's going to say. I'm going to tell you everything you need to know about government and taxes, Ron tells schoolgirl who's diligently taking notes. Life, liberty, and property. That's John Locke. I begin with this example because it so nicely captures who Locke is in American culture today. First, Locke is, as he is for the fictional Swanson, a political philosopher of which the second treatise is best known, in which Locke advances a conception of civil government and mounts a defense of individual rights and liberties. Second, Locke is a kind of abstraction 
virtually synonymous with, and easily used as shorthand for the triad of life, liberty, and property, easily transformed into an adjectival modifier for a variety of isms, namely liberalism and libertarianism, as in Lockean liberalism or Lockean libertarianism. Third and finally, Locke is integrally connected to ideas about what it means to be American. Americans are, to put it bluntly, obsessed with Locke and their obsession is distinctively American. In the 1960s, for example, Sir Isaiah Berlin observed that Locke's influence had been greater in the United States than in Great Britain, England being the country of Locke's birth. In the 1980s, American political theorist Nathan Tarkov observed that there is a very real sense, and I'm quoting here, a very real sense in which Americans can say that Locke is our political philosopher. Fast forward to 2016, when on the eve of US presidential nominating conventions, one political observer noted that Americans needed Locke now more than ever. So it was against this backdrop, this broad context of Locke's status in the contemporary United States, that I wandered into the alcove that housed the National Union catalogs, a printed precursor sort of old school version of WorldCat at the Hoover Institution Library uh, in the early 2010s while I was a graduate student at Stanford. I had gone in search of 19th century editions of Locke's two treatises for a seminar paper that I was writing. One day early into my research, I noticed that Locke's two treatises weren't published by an American press for more than a century between the 1770s and the, the 19 teens, World War I. This finding was surprising and even shocking to me. Right, because like most Americans who had gone to public school or are immersed in or at least familiar with American pop culture, I had learned and somehow internalized that the second treatise had always been Locke's most important, most widely read work, that it was in fact one of the founding texts of the American political tradition. So discovering a kind of absence, right, in terms of publication, I should specify, not it's generally. Discovering a kind of absence suggested to me that the story of Locke in America was more complex and perhaps more interesting than I had realized. As a result, I started asking very basic questions about who Locke was for earlier generations of America. When, how, and why did Americans come to love Locke? And what might the answers about Locke's place in American thought and culture reveal about the American political tradition or tradition have evolved over time. My book, America's Philosopher, is the product of these investigations, my answers to these questions. On its most basic level, my work probes and illuminates Americans' enduring fascination and preoccupation with law. Locke, I show, has always been vitally important uh, in American intellectual life, but its importance has changed dramatically over the term, reveal profound transformations in the history of American thought, culture, politics, and education across U.S. history. For they show a fundamental revolution of the ways in which Americans have thought about how to build a good and just society from an emphasis on the moral character of individuals in the late 18th and 19th centuries to the strength and durability of democratic institutions in the 20th. Now, before I sketch out some of the broad contours of my argument, I wanna take just a moment to introduce John Locke, the historical figure, the man himself. As early Americans knew so well, Locke many hats over the course of his relatively long life, especially by 1700s. He was born in England in 1632. Claire. He never never in North America. If, if I may. But as later betrayed, he knew a great thought of as the new world, as to the rich. Thank you. 
We were having some sound difficulties oh, there. Let's see, can you hear me now? Go ahead, yes, thank you. Can you hear me now? Okay, excellent. Okay. I may leave my video off for just a moment. That's things. So Locus never crossed the Atlantic to the Lord's proprietors of the Carolina colony, and later as a member of the Board of Trade, he knew a great deal about what he thought of as the New World, right? So Locke lived through some of the most tumultuous moments in English history, including those of the English Civil War and the Glorious Revolution. He was, as Mark Goldie so famously put it, a child of the Reformation and a progenitor of the Enlightenment. He was well educated, very well educated, studying and later teaching at Oxford, notoriously witty and beloved by his friends, both male and author of hundreds of tracts, essays, and letters on topics ranging from monetary policy to human psychology, from cultivating silkworms to raising children, from celebrating the reasonableness of Christianity to tracing the origins of civil government. And it was the combination of his erudition, the staggering range of his expertise and his worldliness that so appealed to early Americans who spent so much time engaging with his works and ideas. Across the 18th and the 19th centuries, Americans knew Locke first and foremost for what was then his most famous work, an essay concerning human understanding, which was published the same year as his two treatises, in 1689-1690. This work examined how humans acquire knowledge about themselves and the worlds around them, and an essay concerning human understanding formed the basis for Locke's widespread, omnipresent authority as a kind of wise guide or guru for living well. Early American men and women revered Locke as a model and exemplar from whom they could learn how to engage in everyday activities, activities that ranged from rearing children and cultivating friendships to reading the Bible and keeping a well-organized commonplace book. Figures as different as South Carolinian Eliza Lucas Knee, Philadelphian Benjamin Franklin, Bostonian Abigail Quincy encountered Locke first and foremost through his essay and then seized on a wide range of his works to, in the case of Pinckney and Quincy, raise good children, and in the case of Franklin, pursue projects related to both individual and community improvement. Now, this isn't to say that Americans in the 18th and 19th centuries did not read or engage with Locke's political writings. They absolutely did. But they didn't read Locke's political work in isolation. No more importantly, did they understand it as a positive continuing influence on American political or intellectual life after the 1770s. In the immediate aftermath of independence from Great Britain, Americans scrutinizing a whole list of Locke's political writings and finding fault with them to their so-called modern commitments to what was then becoming known as political science or a science of politics. And in Locke's two treatises, they found examples of outdated and in their eyes misguided political thinking from a distant world where people interested in the origins or nature of government undertook thought experiments, such as imagining future uh, or a social contract. And in another work that they attributed to Locke, his plan of government for the North American Carolina colony in the 1860s, they found a horrifying example of abstract political thinking failing in practice on the ground. So what this meant was that uh, by the turn of the 20th century, fundamentally belonging to the past with relevance for or bearing on the present. This, of course, as we know, changed in the 20th century as a result of a creation of factors, the important of which was that Locke and his two treatises in the 20th century for themselves and for a global world, that of a long-standing American political tradition.
Across the first part of the 20th century, Americans tore down the wall separating the now thoroughly historicized philosopher from the present day, and instead began to trace a line, kind of through line, connecting Locke to the American founders and framers in the 18th century to the United States in the 20th century. And in so doing, they distilled Locke into a few key passages from the second treatise and used them and his perceived influence on Americans past and present to answer big important questions about American political exceptionalism, what they perceived as Americans, uh, 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 their, their, their answer to the question of why American liberal democracy seemed, or at least they hoped, um, was immune to the threats of totalitarianism, fascism, and communism. And they then deployed this reduced, abstracted law and applied him to the most contentious and important debates of the mid 20th century, including those in Washington, D.C. and the U.S. Congress over civil rights legislation. As a result, by the 1950s, for Americans, Locke was best understood as the political thinker author of the Second Treatise and an icon, a kind of political abstraction connected to a political tradition of small L liberalism, and then later in the 1970s, what would become known as libertarianism. And the wide range of Locke's other writings and his expertise on education or human understanding or commonplace, booking, commonplace bookkeeping, all of this, all of this was set aside and forgotten. Now, across the second half of the 20th century, Locke's legacies did not go uncontested quite the opposite. From the political right, figures such as Leo Strauss, Wilmore Kendall, and Russell Kirk sought to reorient attention away from Locke to ancient or at least pre-modern commitments to traditional institutions and societal bonds to correct what they saw as the failings of Locke and liberalism with uh, its celebration of, of what we can call sort of atomistic individualism. And Locke's legacy is face challenges from historians too, who with the so-called Republican turn in historiography on the American founding, sought to decenter Locke and liberalism from the story of the nation's origins. But ironically, in pushing back against the mainstream consensus American way of thinking about Locke, all these late 20th century efforts of questioning, rejection, destabilization, all of this only brought more attention to Locke only focused the, the beam of the spotlight uh, more directly on a certain set of concepts, namely life, liberty, and property associated with the second treatise, only further cemented Locke to liberalism, and only further yoked Locke, liberalism, and the American political tradition. So this version of Locke, the one we know today, uh, was not ever thus. Uh, for someone like Benjamin Franklin in the 18th century, Locke, and indeed what we might think of as an adjective, the adjective Lockean, would have meant something altogether different. Now, beyond recovering Locke's past importance in and for American intellectual life and culture, I hope my book reminds all of us how easy it is uh, to encounter the relatively distant past, say that of the 18th century North American colonies through more modern lenses. How so often we impose our own vision of the world, our own rendering of Locke's importance, for example, on to this more distant past. And so when we study the world, say, of 18th century North American colonies and the young American Republic of the 19th century, we must do so with an awareness of the nuance and contingency, not only of what happened and why, but also how and why we know what we do about it. So I'll end my brief remarks here so we have ample time for, for dialogue and conversation. I'm looking forward to all of your questions and I'm eager to hear from both Leslie and Holly. Thank you so much, Claire. Our first discussant this afternoon is Leslie Buckler, an Associate Professor of History at Dartmouth College, where she teaches American cultural and intellectual history. 
She received her PhD at Yale and taught at Reed College and James Madison College at Michigan State before coming to Dartmouth in 2003. She's the author of Critical Americans, Victorian Intellectuals and Transatlantic Liberal Reform, published by the University of North Carolina Press in 2007. And her current book project, titled American Democracy and the Woman Question, explores what debates over women's role in the family, economy, and polity can tell us about political thought in the 19th century. Leslie, welcome to the Washington History Seminar. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Uh, thank you to everybody for um, including me in this really exciting panel, and especially to Claire um, as the, the reason we are all here for writing such a wonderful book that gives us so much to talk about. So um, I will be fairly brief in my comments. I'll just, I'm going to sort of just lay out a few, a few of the elements of the book or the aspects of the project that I think merit particular praise. Um, and then raise some questions that are sort of just big questions, possibly for Claire to kind of chew on or, uh, you know, larger commentary. So let me just say, you know, um, to begin with, that, it, that it, it's, it was a pleasure, it is a pleasure to read Claire's book. It's, it's a lovely book and I, I really enjoyed it. And I hope everybody who is part of the seminar goes out and buys it because it's, it's really worth reading. And it's very readable, I will say that too. Um, She's done a nice job summarizing the book, so I won't do that here. Uh, I'll, I'll maybe do a little more than I was going to, just in case some people missed some when, when the audio went a little bit in and out. Um, I'll try to add a couple notes just to you know flesh out things. But um, let me just say uh, some of the things that really impressed me about the book. Uh, I think primarily the number one thing I'd say is just the scope of the project. It's an 18th, 19th, and 20th century story, uh, which is really, um, I think, tremendously difficult to pull off and an especially gutsy move for a first book. And for uh, the non-historians non in the room, um, and even the non-US historians, I have to say my, my colleagues uh, who do you know, different parts of the world in different eras uh, think it's kind of silly that Americanists think that's a big deal to do three centuries when they routinely handle, you know, multiple countries and multiple centuries. Um, so let me just explain uh, why um, I think that's a big deal. And that is just, you know, we live in a hyper-specialized era and um, it may seem like the narcissism of small differences to say that early Republic history is vastly different from Gilded Age history, which is vastly different from Cold War history, um, but in fact, it is true. So, you know, to 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 write in all of those fields, um, Claire really had to develop some expertise in all of those fields, uh, specialized historiography. So, right, she has to be engaged with scholars in all these different periods, and um, it, it just I think it's 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 a tremendous achievement to be able to do that and to write comfortably with command in all of these different periods. So. Well done on that. Um, uh, of course, it's only that scope that, you know, that scope is crucial to the book, right? It, could, it has to be an 18th through 20th century story in order for Claire to make the argument that she's making. Um, it's, it's what enables and authorizes that. And that is, you know, this kind of overturn, not overturning exactly, but, but um, showing us a lock that we maybe didn't realize was the lock for most of American history, right? We, we maybe carry around a head, as Claire said, we carry around an idea of lock in our head, which Juan Swanson from Parks and Recreation did as well, um, of the lock of the second treatise, right, as a defender of, you know, limited government and the rights of um, property. Um, but, you know, Claire is, is, of course, showing us a whole different lock that existed for much of American history. Um, as she puts it uh, in one of the many sentences I love in the book, she, you know, while references to the second treatise uh, on government have received the most scholarly attention, they are, as she writes, but one thread, and moreover, an atypical one of a richer and more complex tapestry. And what she does through through these uh, the several chapters is to reveal that tapestry, that rich tapestry, which shows, um, as she as she said in her opening comments, Locke as not just a political philosopher, but as a guide to living well, as um, you know, someone who could teach Americans about how uh, how we acquire knowledge, how we educate young people, how we continue to be educated, um, how you know how to keep a commonplace book, to keep a record of your thoughts and reading. Uh, but he was sort of you know this this sort of every everyday guide to living well, which would influence how Americans, early Americans, also thought of works like the Second Treatise, right? So these things aren't aren't mutually exclusive, but it it helped sort of build out the picture of Locke. Um, and so the story she tells, you know, the overall argument is. Um, 
Yeah, I always think of it like, a, you know, the, I don't know, this is probably dating me, but the MT MTV used to do those kind of like behind the band, the rise and fall of every band. So we have sort of here, the, 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 the story of Locke is the story of 18th century ubiquity, right? He's everywhere in every different capacity. Lots of people are reading him for different reasons. There's a 19th century fade, right? So he starts to kind of disappear from the center of maybe intellectual and political life for a whole series of reasons, some of which clear light out, some of which may come up with questions and answers. And then there's this reemergence in the 20th century and an elevation of Locke in newly powerful but constrained and highly political ways, right? So the 18th century Locke as guide to living is gone and now we just have the Locke of the second treatise. Um, so that's the arc of the story. It's not the rise and fall, but the, the ubiquity fade and reappearance in, in, in precise ways. Um, now that argument Claire is able to make and tell that story, you know, show us that rich tapestry because of her broad spectrum research method. Um, she's, you know, she's done meticulous work in private papers, in uh, periodicals, books, obviously, and what maybe didn't come through in her comments as much, but in, in college curricula and the notes of students from the 19th century, right? So she has a whole study of how students were learning about Locke in the college classroom and what their thoughts were on Locke. Um, so she's able to kind of make, make this argument about the 18th century ubiquity, the 19th century fade, and the 20th century reemergence through her careful assembling of the archive here. Um, some of the stories that she tells in, are really delightful, and they're, you know, again, depend on close readings. Um, Eliza Pinckney uh, is one of the figures from the 18th century who's you know, reading uh, Locke on how to educate her children. She does a really nice deep dive on uh, founding fathers, on Adams and, and Jefferson, how they're engaging Locke. Um, and then a really meticulous, uh, I think it's just a gem of archival reconstruction of Merle Curdy's seminal 1937 essay from which the title of her book is drawn, America's Philosopher, where that comes from, what were the sort of institutional, intellectual, professional uh, contexts for uh, Curdy seizing on, on Locke and, and, and beginning this 20th century re rehabilitating story. And um, I should say also her eye uh, for these telling anecdotes and her ability to narrate them uh, is what makes America's Philosopher really such a pleasure to read. Um, so add writing to another aspect. It's not just the research, it's actually the writing that also is, uh, merits the praise. Uh, so that's just sort of a, you know, some of the, the elements that I think deserve, um, you know, calling it special attention to uh, for being particularly praiseworthy. And then let me just throw out some questions. These are not criticisms, but really just questions I have um, you know, often just things that I would like to know more about or um, you know, questions I just would like to hear Claire think a lot about. So my main one is sort of a process question. Um, and I guess I'm thinking uh, I have different metaphors that are going around in my head, but one is, is like, it's sort of an invitation to Claire to let us behind the curtain uh, to sort of see the workings of her wizardry. And let me explain what I mean by that. Um, it's just the book is, it's a very economical book. It's not, you know, it's not long and windy. It's a kind of short and sharp book, very admirably so. Um, and it's very tight and tidy, uh, which I, I'm sure is testament uh, to the many difficult choices Claire had to make along the way, right, in researching and writing the subject. So I was wondering if Claire could just give us a sense of some of the, the friction and the difficulties encountered, you know, the, the rabbit holes left unexplored, or, um, or maybe they were explored, but you were able to extricate yourself from them. Um, and I say this as someone who cannot resist a rabbit hole. So I'm curious how you, how you, how you did get out of them. Uh, but you know, the rabbit holes left unexplored or the puzzles that, that left unsolved, or even just the, the sort of um, pieces of the story that got left on the cutting room floor because they didn't fit the tidy and, and admirably economical argument you're telling. Um, so I think that would be uh, interesting. I mean, one, you know, a couple of the, the sort of places where I think this might be true is I, I wonder, for example, if there um, is more to say about how women used Locke um, for maybe feminist or proto-feminist um, purposes, right? His, his theories of education, um, uh, his critique of patriarchy, even if it's, you know, not done in a, in a, in a feminist manner, um, you know, are there ways that, that women throughout history have been using him? I mean, I'm thinking of, uh, he seems that his theories of education and knowledge seem important to someone like Judah Sargent Murray, 
in the 1780s and 90s. So are there other stories like that that didn't make it in because they didn't fit, but, but still there's a story. Um, I also wonder if there's more to say on how Locke gets enlisted in the sectional debate over slavery and ultimately even the Civil War. And I'm thinking there about ideas of not just what he says in, in the Carolina constitutions on slavery, but thinking about um, notions of you know, self-government, consent of the governed, and if that becomes uh, a sort of a talking point for the two different sections during the, the great conflict of the Civil War. Um, so that's just some of the ways that I, you know, I'm wondering if some of that's on the cutting room floor. The second question I had, just a big question, is about the end point. Um, and I completely understand the need to just stop a story when you need to stop a story. They can sprawl forever. I, uh, I well know this. Um, but I'm curious about the ending with Rawls and Nozick and not say, um, you know, just a few years later by thinking of works by um, feminist scholars and African-American scholars that are, are using Locke to think about race and gender. Um, you mentioned Carol Pateman, but you don't really engage uh, the sexual contract. Um, I'm also thinking of Charles Mills on the racial contract. But, but I also think since those early works, there's also been a more, it seems like a more um, nuanced and fuller um, feminist engagement with Locke. Again, around these questions of education, uh, and, and the education of girls in particular, his, his fairly, you know, fairly egalitarian ideas about that. Um, his emphasis on, on the voluntary and consensual nature of marriage. Um, and, and then again, just this larger critique of patriarchy. Um, and then, so then that's one other. And then the last question I really have is sort of just a real, you know, throw it out there question, but it's on, um, this idea of US intellectual history as reception of non-Americans <laughs> as a history. I mean, you know, my, my colleagues in um, European history often joke that it confirms their view that American intellectual history is in fact an oxymoron, right? Uh, that there are no American intellectuals. Of course, that's not true. Um, but I wonder, you know, we the, your your work, this book joins a growing shelf. I have I have them all on a shelf together of books. Um, you know, Jennifer Renton Rosenhagen and Nietzsche, um, Drew, Drew, I don't know how to pronounce his last name, Massier, Massier on Edmund Burke, um, George Kotkin on the existentialists, and, and many, many more. Um, and I'm just wondering. You know, is this something that you think has legs, and we're gonna, you know, just sort of go through the canon of of non-American thinkers, or um, it, it, does it have the, you know, the potential to kind of play itself out? And then related to that is this question of of which you you sort of speculate on, but I, I guess I'd like to hear more on on why you think it is that Americans. I mean, I know the specific reasons, you know, during the Cold War that you talk about, but there there seems to have been like, why not Madison? Like, why why Locke? Why this need? And you you, know, you mentioned it several times that there's a distinctively American usage of Locke here. And I'm just sort of wondering um, if this, this is sort of a larger uh, question about Americans and um, the newness of, of the American experiment or something like that, that explains this kind of need for antecedent philosophers. So big, big, broad questions, but um, that's, that's what I have. And just congratulations on a wonderful book. Thank you. Claire, there are a number of questions on the table. If you have thoughts or responses, this would be a good time. Excellent. Leslie, thank you so much, both uh, for what you said about my book and uh, for these three, maybe four or five um, excellent, excellent questions. Let me take a minute uh, to address your your first question, uh, and then which may sort of bring me also to your second question about why not bring it up uh, more to the to the end of the twentieth century, uh, and uh, even into the twenty first century, perhaps in contemporary conversations that are ongoing. So. With respect to the the question of what's you know what I left behind, what's on the on, on the uh, sort of floor of the of the, <laughs> I had to I had to leave behind several um, in, important I think and in, in interesting stories I'll say, all of which would add 
I think, additional nuance and specificity or examples to the broad arc that I'm of the narrative that I'm telling. And so I think for to pick just one example, your question about, let's say, sort of Locke appearing in debates and sectional debates in, in, in the sort of the years, decades leading up to the Civil War, and then in conversations about uh, slavery and the Civil War in particular in the 1850s and then the 1860s. Americans are absolutely using Locke and referencing him on, on, a, on occasion in places like the congressional record, both Northerners and Southerners. But as they're engaging with Locke in these questions about the Civil War and about slavery in particular, they are doing so in, in the ways that um, other 19th century Americans are uh, using Locke and engaging with him. So what I mean by this is they are not thinking of Locke primarily as a political thinker or a political theorist. And they may reference his second treatise as uh, they do across the 18th, the 19th and 20th centuries. Their primary association of Locke um, is with uh, his epistemology and any number of other works. And so my job in, in telling this multi-century story is to try to always identify what the most important, the most prominent, dominant use of Locke is, and to call attention to that, and 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 then to think about the ways in which we may see exceptions that uh, that 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 test this uh, pattern that I'm identifying. The big decision that I had to make, and this is what brings me to question number two, right? The sort of the big decision that I had to make was, as you say, where to end my story. And again, this came down to uh, sort of two uh, commitments, I'll say. So one is to what I just mentioned, which is to think about sort of the, the, the most sort of mainstream, popular, not just academic or uh, uh, philosophical approach to understanding Locke. And of course, with Rawls and Nozick, this may uh, seem somewhat sort of ironic questions that they are engaging in become uh, so central to the more mainstream, broad, sort of political, cultural conversation surrounding uh, sort of Locke and the abstraction of Locke into this adjective in the late 20th century. The second commitment that I, I, I felt sort of strongly um, or that I felt particular attachment to was a commitment to my role as a historian. And one of the challenges that I faced in doing this project was both engaging with and recognizing contemporary debates and conversations and interventions in uh, scholarship on, on, on Locke and what we know about Locke is changing, I mean, very sort of dramatically. And it was changing even as I was working on this project. And I have to be aware of those lenses. I have to be aware of those contemporary uh, conversations and debates and, and renderings of Locke, but I have to do so so that I, I can set them aside and instead ask what, what lenses my historical subjects themselves were using. And so while I bring the story very briefly into the 21st century um, by, by way of an epilogue, I, I felt that sort of ending in, in what I felt like was a, a sort of still deeply historical moment for me in the 1970s felt sort of truer to my commitments as, um, as, as a historian um, and someone who is more comfortable perhaps working in the 18th century rather than the late 20th or 21st century. But I think your questions are really good ones and maybe there's, there's space. I think there is room um, for more work to be done. Um, I think especially as you were saying, Leslie, on the sort of the um, feminist uh, readings and uses of Locke, and then especially on some, some of his um, particular ideas about sort of a quality of education and educational opportunity. Um, and here I'm thinking of, you know, people 
who are doing really interesting work, someone like Rita Cogginson, who's doing really interesting work um, on Rousseau and Locke and contemporary 21st century debates over education and public school education in particular. Actually, to address your, your third question about, you know, it's, I, I, I am, well aware that I am in very good company joining uh, historians who are figures and Glory Luz, Steve Shildian, Adam Smith. So I think there is an increasing attention among intellectual historians and American intellectual historians about the ways in which American intellectual history is perhaps um, uh, it's sort of isolated uh, uh, conversation only at America, rather broader, it's part of a mobilization uh, that is the global topic with many of the figures that we're looking at um, in particular. I don't know. I, I, would hesitate to um, in terms of my own work. I'm very Stuart Mill. The in thinking about the sort of ways in which Mill is playing a very important role in the 19th and early 20th century United States. I think that these projects, my sense is that they emerge less out of particular attention and interest, a particular interest in figures themselves and more in the questions that intellectual brains are about what happened, how past over, about what happened and why this mattered to them. And so as we think about answering Locke or Burke or Smith and discover that, that for them or for early Americans, for 18th, 19th and early 20th century Americans, these figures uh, loomed large in American intellectual life. And it's in some ways impossible to address the most important points about American intellectual life without attention to them. I may leave it there and then we, I can sort of I don't know, you know, jump back in and answer some more questions um, after I've, I've had a chance to also speak to some of Polly's comments as well. Does that sound good? Sounds good. Sure. And we uh, have to deal with I guess post Brexit, UK internet issues here, um, but we got we got most of that. Before we continue with our second discussant, uh, let me remind those uh, who are tuning in um, that you can join the discussion by using the raise hand function in Zoom or use the Q and A function. You can start queuing up right now, uh, and uh, we will turn to the discussion shortly. A few people have their hands raised. That's terrific. Uh, we'll get to you shortly. Our second discussant this afternoon is Holly Brewer, the Burke Professor of American History and Associate Professor at the University of Maryland. She's a specialist in early American history and the early British Empire, as well as early modern debates about justice. She's the author of By Birth or Consent, Children, Law, and the Anglo-American Revolution in Authority, uh, published in 2007 with the University of North Carolina Press, and she's currently finishing a book that examines the origins of American slavery in larger political and ideological debates, and it's tentatively entitled Slavery and Sovereignty in Early America and the British Empire, a project for which she was awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship in 2014, and a part of that project appeared in the American Historical Review in October of 2017. Holly, welcome to the seminar. Hi, thanks. It's great to be here. And uh, thank you, everyone, for staying on board, even despite some of the connection difficulties. So um, I was fascinated reading this book. I learned a lot. Um, so many really interesting details about how many different people were engaging with Locke's writings in so many different ways. And um, I'm going to talk about some of those details and what I learned, but I want to start with something that uh, I was least satisfied with in terms of the book. 
And that is, there's no sense here of what Locke was arguing against. And it's no doubt because of what I've been doing in thinking about monarchy and slavery and um, uh, um, ideas of government that Locke was arguing against. So uh, the power of kings, hereditary um, status, lack of consent, um, what happened in America before the Glorious Revolution with the Dominion of New England, which had no elected governance at all for the five northern colonies for, for five years while James II was king, um, that I feel that the, that lack, that, that missing element so keenly. And so one of my main questions is going to be, what happens when you put some of that reality that America was not maybe liberal from the beginning and was part of a British empire in which there was a monarchy. What happens when you put that back in just a little bit more? Um, and in particular, I want to point out something. I mean, it's just, it's hard because I'm so deeply immersed in the primary sources that I see things that you wouldn't, you in a different way than you, that I see things that you wouldn't have noticed in terms of some of these issues about power and the extent to which these two treatises of government were controversial. So, for example, Algernon Sidney, who was writing his discourses concerning government at about the same time as Locke was writing his two treatises of government in the early 1680s, um, the, was executed for treason on the basis of arguing for those kinds of principles, um, mainly. I mean, there was a few other things that went on, but the inspector, the censor general, the inspector of the press, uh, Roger Lestrange, pounded on his door in 1683 and used a general warrant to come in, steal manuscripts from a chest, and those became crucial evidence in his, his treason trial, for, you know, for which he had his head chopped off. And Locke's own works, especially his works on um, his works on government, were so controversial that during his lifetime they never had his name on them. And when William Penn sent um, those texts at you, this is one of the anecdotes of yours that I love so much. When William Penn sent those copies of Locke's works to Pennsylvania at the beginning of the 18th century, he was doing it within an atmosphere where it was dangerous. To actually cite and quote Locke, particularly his ideas about government. There's a great um, cartoon, which I use occasionally in teaching, which has a man with an ax standing behind the head of a minister, behind the back of a minister in England, in England in the 17th teens. And he's got Locke's two treatises on a shelf above him, along with a few other books. And, and, and the, um, the words coming out of the executioner with the axes hand is be careful what you say. And, and people who wrote seditious words weren't necessarily going to be executed. They might, like Daniel Defoe, writing in 1703, seem to have mildly criticized the queen, just be thrown in jail, charged with sedition, and fined the equivalent of seven years of his take-home pay, which meant in debtor's prison terms that he was never going to get out unless something happened and he got a pardon. I'm, I'm just putting this out there in a very vague way. In a very well, specifically, I suppose, but there are these questions about power here that weave their way through Locke's reception, and I just want to untangle them just a little bit more. So, in America in the 17th century, only two colonies had printing presses, and those were Massachusetts and Pennsylvania. Most other colonies, it was actually illegal to have a printing press. So it isn't actually surprising that Locke's works weren't reprinted, but it's especially not surprising that the two treatises of government were, were reprinted, because those were more dangerous than the rest. And I'm going to pause now and step back. And one of the things that I love the most about your work, on the other hand, is the rich way in which you explore the reception of Locke's all other, Locke's other texts, especially his essay concerning human understanding, which there's no doubt, whichever Enlightenment philosopher you read, whether in France or Germany or anywhere else, they're all reading Locke's essay concerning human understanding, which is foundational to the Enlightenment. It's, it's a method, it lays out this method of how we learn, of how we know what we know, which is so rigorous that it becomes 
it's about how a person can become enlightened. And that's why in a way, I think almost that work gives its name to the enlightenment. Where does that come from? I'm gonna pause and say my own, it was so interesting, especially the way you ended with Rald and Nozick. Since I was a student at Harvard in the 1980s when both of them were still teaching philosophy there. Not taking classes directly with them, but taking classes where we read their work and taking classes with others who, for whom their work was central. And, but even but then one of my questions became, and which became the guiding focus of my first book was, why did John Locke write so much about children? Um, and why did none of the faculty talk about it? And the answer was that for him, children were crucial because they could not give meaningful consent. And so they were a crucial way of demarcating who was allowed to consent and who was not. And in a way, all of Locke's other works, which he wrote mostly after the two treatises of government, that is his essay concerning human understanding, thoughts on education, reasonableness of Christianity, his methods for um, commonplacing, which Claire um, elucidates with such um, care and brilliance, all of that is um, our methods to, to answer the question he leaves open in the two traditions of government. How do people develop reason enough to be able to consent to their own government and to be bound by it and to get the understanding they need to frame uh, a virtuous government? And so it's really interesting to me that these other works are so popular when, when the second treatise is not, but it's also so interesting that it is, um, I mean, I think, I think it's more influential even with the Declaration of Independence maybe than CTG suggests. Um, and not just reflecting norms, but in fact, helping to push arguably the United States in a more radical direction. And so one of my first, my first big question, it's not only about what happens when you put some of this more conservative or patriarchal story back in, which is also something that Leslie was suggesting a bit, of like the, the patriarchal theories of government. Um, but what if he was more radical um, and, and he's kind of scary. And some of your people who are rejecting him on these ideas about equality that are in there, that are in central to his writing, and that also central to, you know, the leveling ideas of the Declaration of Independence, as one of the contemporary critics wrote it, wrote about it. Um, what happens if you if you see that see him as slightly more radical, and you understand the opposition? to some of his writings as more about conservatives or what about what if giving a more conservative perspective, what if it's more about taming the potential radicalism of some of these ideas? I wanted to point as well in terms of the rich material to um, some of what you found about Queen Charlotte, the wife of George III reading Don Locke. So if you've got how ironic is it that you got Locke potentially influencing the declaration, um, but also influencing the, this, the prince and heir to the throne of George III, King of England. And no wonder I was thinking as I was reading it that the young George III became the leader of the opposition along with Charles James Fox and others who actually supported the American revolutionaries in, in 1770. And but I was especially interested by what you did with the debates of the 20th century, because I am much familiar with this. I have read, um, I know someone in the chat mentioned C.B. McPherson, whose work I have engaged very deliberately in my own work. Um, I studied with Carol Payton, she was actually on my dissertation committee, the sexual contract, which was mentioned here. Um, but those are kind of later, but a lot of this earlier history I hadn't read in detail. Um, and. I was utterly fascinated to learn that Charles and Mary Bird, Beard had somewhat, you know, almost um, 
Well, I told Robert Nozick and others more conservative, you know, conservative reading of John Locke as emphasizing and privileging um, property so much, which is something that that's then picked up on by someone like C.B. McPherson as well um, as as Nozick. And again, I I've read other scholars more recently who see Locke as more radical in some of the same ways that I do, and it's arguable that he meant something different by property than we do in certain key ways. So when he defines property, he uses the word often propriety, and he talks about one's ownership of one's own person, first and foremost, um, which is potentially a very different reading if that's the case, and, and especially paired with ideas about individual rights. Um, and I think, I think that's most of my main comments, but I guess the, the, the last big question for you is, is really, is if he was so central, and, and let me, let me, actually, let me, before I ask this, let me, let me, let me put it a different way. You say at one point that Locke wasn't that radical in terms of the declaration because most of those ideas were already in practice in terms of the lower houses of assembly having some power to consent to government. Um, and you, you cite John Philip Reed. But um, in some ways, the settlement of the lower houses having that much authority is a result of the Glorious Revolution in which John Locke was directly involved, including in setting up the post in the 1690s, as you know, and you mentioned, John Locke was on the Board of Trade with, with some responsibility over, over colonial policies. And, and after the Gresham Revolution, most colonies had an elected a lower house, which wasn't as clear before the, the would happen before the Gresham Revolution. So to some extent, the, the extent to which the lower house of assembly had some power had something to do with John Locke's role in oversight in the 1690s, if I'm making any sense at all. Um, so my question is, um, to what extent, if, if Locke is America's philosopher, this is your central claim, and I think you show that really well, to what extent is owning him, whether on the right or the left, sort of fundamental to shaping what America is? Or to what extent does that become key to the, the question? In the 20th century. I, um, somebody was telling me last week about some conservative conference, which um, uh, where it was debated whether John Locke was really a conservative or not, and where they decided, apparently, I mean, I don't, I don't even know who the speaker was. This was a couple of weeks ago. Um, they decided, apparently, that since there was some evidence that he was racist and intolerant, despite his essay on toleration, they, that maybe he actually was a conservative. But I say this is a kind of um, horrified joke, but um, there is a lot at stake in saying both that he defined America's principles of governance as and democracy and shaping what the terms of that was. Um, and would you um, agree, given that, that, um, that maybe some of this, these arguments in the 20th century in particular um, went, were, were actually in some ways sort of terribly inaccurate. That's the big question. Thank you very much. Claire, thoughts? Thank you, Holly. I think you asked some very big and important questions and have given me a lot to I'm sure I'll only scratch the surface in the couple of minutes um, that I have I have here. And I'm I'm eager for a sort of more extended conversation with you at some point, um, given where you are in your own research um, for your for your current book. So I think to your question about the 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 things that Locke has provided a thread throughout his writings, both his work on government, his work on education, and an essay concerning human understanding, 
and his many religious writings, right? Locke is writing in, to oppose authoritarianism. He's writing in, in a kind of anti-authoritarian. He's writing to privilege the, and, and to bring attention to and to argue for the sovereignty of the people, right? He's writing to elevate the pursuit of truth and rationality, the power of human understanding. And also I think, right, I mean, the power of sort of ordinary individuals to understand, uh, make meaning of, and uh, ultimately better their world. And this is all, as you say so nicely, Holly, profoundly radical and profoundly destabilizing, but it's profoundly radical and profoundly destabilizing in a way that I think many 18th century Americans find very much in line. This is before I'm talking about sort of pre-revolution, pre-1776, that many Americans find so in line with, with the debates and the questions that they're engaging with. Debates over religion, say during the First Great Awakening, where you have both pro-revival uh, uh, thinkers, uh, people like Elijah Williams and others, and you have the more, uh, for lack of a better word, sort of conservative anti-revival thinkers in during the First Great Awakening, they're both turning to Locke. And on the one hand, they're reading Locke's writings on, on government and religion and saying, ah, we have someone here who's emphasizing the importance of the individual experience of religion, that religion cannot be coerced, cannot be something that is forced upon an individual from on high. And then at the same time, you have uh, 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 people who are reading Locke's reasonableness, Christianity, and saying, you know, no, Locke is actually arguing against the kind of overly emotive, overly emotional uh, 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 sort of evangelical religion that's emerging out of the revivalist during the First Great Awakening. And I think it's this, and I turn to this example because, and I, I think there's a kind of uh, duality, there's a kind of way in which so many different people can turn to and find uh, 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 sort of relevance in, what, in Locke's writings that he is in, incredibly useful for 18th century people, but he's useful primarily as someone for them to think with and alongside. And so I think this then also brings me to, as you were talking about a little bit, I was writing this down, some of your questions about um, you know, the extent to which the, the, the two treatises is controversial, but then at the same time, very much um, at, at the sort of heart, as you were saying, of uh, in sort of an understanding in the colonies of the, of the importance of, um, you know, uh, consent-based government or rejection of authoritarianism, a kind of rejection of monarchy. I think what's interesting, right, so to answer your question, what I found in, in my research is that, you know, in say the 1760s, a figure like James Otis is turning to Locke and Locke's second treatise and doing so precisely because he's seeing Locke as a kind of moderate voice. And again, this is not necessarily that that's a correct interpretation. And I think Holly, you may sort of push back against that in very legitimate ways. But for someone like Otis, Locke at least has the, has the appearance, we'll say, of being a more moderate voice on many of the same issues that uh, he and Algernon Sidney were writing about. But Sidney is viewed as having been by Otis, for example, more radical. And I think then to your question, which is such a good one about, you know, Locke himself is involved in what's happening during the Glorious Revolution in the late eight, uh, 1680s and then the early 1690s. He's integral to the, the changes, the fundamental changes that are happening to the English constitution, to English government in the 17th century. And so why not say that when uh, Jefferson and others are, are turning to and thinking about the sort of deep tradition of English political thinking and English constitutionalism, why not say that in some ways they're, they're actually sort of turning to and engaging more deeply with Locke as a political thinker than, than we would ever assume today. And I think part of this gets back to one of my, my answers to this gets back to my response to Leslie, which is I'm interested in sort of the question of insofar 
or the question of sort of to what extent are they attributing these, these things to Locke? To what extent would they associate what you and your research and what I might know or anyone here listening might associate with Locke's involvement in the late, temp, late 17th century, in the late 18th century, on this to this tradition of kind of English legal constitutional political thinking? And I think the answer uh, is, is I, I there's so much here uh, that I could that I could get into. Um, maybe just to ask your final question, which is about the sort of extent, if I'm if I'm in a back correct to with many of the 20th century debates do a disservice to our understanding both of the historical laws he was right thinking and living in the same century, the uh, ways in which Americans are engaging thought. And I think in, in many ways the answer is yes. But I also think that of I mean, there's so many happening. You draw to one of the most surprising things for me to comment in the questions about McPherson and uh, his his work in um, sort of Locke and the theory of possessive individualism, attributing a kind of emphasis on um, sort of capitalist accumulation uh, in, as being sort of central to Locke's philosophy and emphasis on private property and the protection of it. And one of the most surprising things to me was to discover that this is something that's emerging in the 19-teens and 1920s. And it's emerging with Charles and Mary Beard. And Charles Beard is the really the first person who distills and reduces Locke to uh, defense of private property and a sort of capitalist accumulation in particular. What I find so interesting, the, the, the reason we, um, sort of in this intervention, there are ongoing conversations about the extent to which Locke is actually the fount of and the foundation of socialist theory, socialist thinking, um, uh, to the extent to which Locke forms the basis of ideas about a labor theory of value, for example. And so I think part of my work is, is it's challenging, right, to, to say, uh, to uh, pay attention to what concerns my historical actors in the 20th century have, the debates that they're engaging in, as so you point out, the ways in which they themselves are, are not accurately or not fully interpreting or understanding Locke and Locke's political thought in particular. So maybe I'll leave it there. I, uh, and, and then maybe we can sort of come back to some of your, your comments uh, over the course of our conversation. Thank you very much. Thank All you. right, we have some people waiting very patiently uh, with their hands raised and some questions in the Q and A. Uh, Alexander Bolton, uh, if you are there, if you will unmute yourself, please pose your question. Uh, hello, I've been uh, waiting uh, for C.B. McPherson's name to appear. I'm glad to uh, see that um, the participants have been discussing that. Um, so that was the, the nature of my question at the very beginning of the uh, conversation, which I've been enjoying, been enjoying very much. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Tom Hirsch. Uh -huh. uh yeah, I mean, can I just say super quickly, if you're really interested in those questions about to what extent did, did Locke justify slavery in his theory of property, um, I have an explicit critique of C.B. McPherson on these questions and my article on creating a common law of slavery for England and its New World Empire, in which I contend that it's actually not Locke, but the the royalists, the absolutists who are, who are coming up with this theory of people as property, which, and that he's actually arguing against it. But 
you can take whatever you, I mean, I don't talk about him a lot in that, but more frame where it's really coming from. So it's actually an explicit critique of C.B. McPherson. If you're really interested in him, that you might be interested in that. Perhaps you could type the uh, citation uh, in the chat for the entire group, uh, Holly, so everyone can see it. Tom Hirsch, your hand has been up for a bit. If you would unmute yourself, pose your question. Tom Hirsch. You appear to be unmuted on my screen, but I'm not hearing you. Alas, <laughs> this may be the question that you have posed in the Q&A as well. So I'm going to pose your question, or at least one of your questions, uh, in which you write that I have finished a biography of the forgotten founder, Dr. Benjamin Rush, uh, who was the most strident abolitionist founder. I know that he corresponded and knew George Mason, uh, who would not sign the Constitution without an end to the slave trade. Did Locke and Rush have correspondence on slavery? Claire. Uh, so uh, thank you for your question, Tom. Uh, so no, Locke and Rush uh, did not correspond. Um, Rush, I, th I think, is born several decades after Locke dies. But Rush, like so many 18th century Americans, um, is engaging very deeply um, with and thinking very carefully about Locke's, Locke's work and things. Um, and he's also engaging, I think, with, with an interesting um, sort of puzzle or an interesting uh, uh, problem that many 18th century Americans are grappling with, which is how you can have government uh, of theories or theorizing or thinking about governments is this oh my <laughs> oh she's back claire we lost you there for a moment yes i think i'm back so uh rush is engaging in these conversations in the 1780s very thoroughly Thank you. Thank you. Catherine Albanese has a hand up. Please unmute. OK, thank you. I wasn't sure I was going to unmute. Um, I'm an American religious historian, and I learned um, my law chiefly through Jonathan Edwards, who used a theory that scholars call sensationalism to explain revival phenomena and encourage um, preachers to try to excite the members of their conversation so that the Holy Spirit could then enter in. And um, I recall that theory very clearly um, discussed in terms of Edwards, but when we get to the Second Great Awakening and the Third and the whole tradition of revivalism in, in America, it seems to evaporate. I mean, I've never seen anybody talk about the Second Great Awakening in terms of Lockean sensationalism. So I'm wondering if you can comment on that. Is this part of um, the 19th and then 20th century dismissal of the essay concerning human understanding, or is this revival evangelical case um, more sharp and more clearly defined than what happens in the rest of the culture. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Catherine. I think you're so right to call attention to Edwards and Edwards' very close, uh, careful reading and engagement um, with, with Locke and, and Locke's essay and work on education and religion more generally. I, I think, your your question about sort of what happens to to Locke 
in, in during the second great awakening is a very interesting one. And I think you're you're right in calling attention to transformations that are happening in the 19th century um, in, in terms of how Americans are engaging with Locke's essay concerning human understanding. And this is some of what Leslie was getting to in her comments and questions a couple of minutes ago, right? So thinking about the kind of the, the, the fade aspect of Locke's story um, in the 19th century, which is to say that as Americans begin to engage with and think more, more sort of, uh, 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 well, sort of more intensely with uh, Scottish common sense philosophy and uh, theories of sort of German idealism. We can think about the sort of the transcendentalists, right? Someone like Ralph Waldo Emerson really sort of turning to a thinker like Kant and, and rejecting much and rejecting uh, many aspects of Locke and Lockean appearance. Uh, empiricism in favor of sort of a, a Kantian idealism. But what I thought was really interesting and to um, sort of speak to your question, what I thought was interesting in, in what I found in, in looking into religious uses of Locke during the Second Great Awakening. So during the sort of, um, you know, early to well, mid 19th century, I was struck by the ways in which Americans are turning to and using uh, two works of Locke's, which are, I think, largely forgotten today. So they're thinking not just about his essay concerning human understanding, um, but they're thinking about and they're reading and they're publishing editions of um, his reasonableness um, of Christianity. Uh, and uh, then also, uh, you know, the sort of Unitarian, someone like Andrews Norton, so not sort of as part of the Second Great Awakening, but in this, in this moment, Norton is uh, adding a preface to a new edition of one of Locke's uh, uh, important works, a paraphrase and notes on the epistles of St. Paul. Um, and Norton is saying that Locke should be remembered as one of the sort of great English theologians of his age. And so what I noticed in this 19th century moment is that almost a less sort of careful engagement with Locke's theology, sort of Locke's religious thinking, we'll say, sort of Locke's theology, Locke's philosophy, and instead this this sort of um, more, more almost casual reference uh, to Locke as this wise uh, and um, important thinker who publishes in, in sort of important works on religion. Um, but the emphasis is more on the on the sort of Lockean character, so to speak, and Locke's own process at acqu of acquiring um, religious no knowledge and sort of reading um, and, 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 and taking notes on the Bible in a very particular way. And there's an increasing emphasis on that rather than, as you say, this very sort of deep and careful engagement with the, the philosophy of, of Locke um, that we see in someone like Edwards in the 18th century. I, I was so fascinated by that part of your work. I actually have this whole long essay I've written on, on Locke's notes on the, on the epistles, which is, tends to be so ignored. And he actually argues for some pretty radical readings of the Bible in that, which I think is underappreciated. So it's so interesting that so many people were picking up on that. I, I took careful notes on all those parts of your book where you mentioned that. Yeah, I mean, it was surprising to me too. It was not a work that I was familiar with until I kept popping up in the archives and the historical record and sent me down all these rabbit holes that turned out to not be rabbit holes. Um, yeah, kind of absolutely. absolutely fascinating. So let me, I have several questions that I want to, to get in here, but I'm afraid I'm gonna have to bring you into the 20th century, uh, the period in which I'm more comfortable uh, than the earlier years. Um, and in your chapter on Locke and the invention of the American political tradition, uh, you raise the issue of the Second World War uh, and the ways in which Locke was impressed into service um, on the American side, um, uh, contributing to the deliberations about American uh, intervention. And for some, he was a symbol of ideals, you say, uh, liberty, equality, and democracy that tied Americans to their English counterparts. Um, the question that I have is, to what extent 
was this widely known. You cite John Chamberlain, a reporter who, who draws upon Locke, but this is new to me. Um, and I'm interested in knowing the extent to which those responsible for generating the propaganda uh, on the part of the government uh, to prepare Americans for entry into the war and or then to fight the war needed Locke as opposed to, I don't know, just the broader concepts of democracy versus fascism, you know, freedom versus totalitarianism. So if you could just say a little bit more about how and why some contemporaries felt the need to deploy Locke, how they did so, and to what effect? Thank you for that question, Eric. I think the late 1930s, early 1940s moment that you're calling attention to is, a, is an interesting one. And it, in some ways was a challenging one to write about because there does not seem to be the consensus, we'll say, the widespread understanding that we have following the Second World War, beginning really in the late 1940s, the consensus that American newsrooms and the halls of Congress, sort of all different places of American intellectual and political life, the kind of consensus that will arise um, over Locke's importance and Locke's centrality. We see uh, some sort of un un uncertainty, we'll say, about whether or not uh, Americans in, in the late 19, or we'll say the sort of 1930s, late 1930s, at this time I'm, I'm, I'm writing about in 1939 as the United States is weighing entry into World War II. There's some uncertainty about the extent to which sort of what, you know, what does Locke represent? Um, is Locke a spokesman for democracy? Is he a spokesman for capitalism? As I said a minute ago, you know, is he actually a spokesman for, for socialism? Um, and, and there's some sort of anxiety um, among those, even people like the historian Merrill Curdy, who are turning or who are in sort of um, turning to Locke and recognizing that there may be something, there may be a there there, there may be a kind of through line, some continuity between past and present generations of Americans linking um, Locke to some aspect of what it means to be sort of American or have an American political tradition. But to answer your question about sort of what's going on in this moment of the Second World War and debates over entry into um, the war itself, what I think is interesting here is that there seems to be a, 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 a sort of very clear sense that Locke is undergoing a transformation in this moment during the Second World War. And it's a transformation where Locke will go from being interpreted as an English philosopher. So in the, in the passage from my book that you are referencing, where I talk about these debates in October of 1939, right? The idea is that uh, people in, in Congress, uh, politicians are turning to Locke and saying, Locke is England's philosopher. Locke is, is evidence for why the United um, should sort of uh, join and write Britain. Um, and there's some sort of um, lines and, and, and points of parallel drawn with, with someone like Rousseau and with France. Uh, but there's a sense that, that Locke is sort of important because he is English. And this changes almost overnight. <laughs> And it's, it, it's, it's hard to capture the, the sort of the speed with which this transformation takes place. But by the end of the war, so by the sort of dawn, the start of the Cold War, the late 1940s, Locke is seen not just by politicians and, 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 and um, those sort of in, uh, engaging in debates um, uh, in Washington, but also in, in places like um, political science classrooms and college campuses. Locke is seen no longer primarily as an English philosopher, although of course people are recognizing that he was born in England, but he's seen as being uh, in, in some sense American. And it's because there has been 
um, and, and the sort of creation of something new, which is the American political tradition in the singular and a quest for sort of uh, a long, deep roots for this tradition, for this political tradition that stretch back beyond Madison, beyond the Federalist Papers, beyond the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence to something older and, and sort of deeper and more possibly uh, sort of fundamental uh, to um, American culture and society and, and politics. Uh, but there's tremendous sort of uncertainty um, I would say over, over Locke's fate as late as the 1930s and even the very early 1940s. And it's really not until the late 1940s that we see a kind of um, certainty that Locke um, is, is peculiarly, sort of um, particularly important, we'll say, um, for Americans and perhaps even best understood as an American rather than an English or a British philosopher. So let me ask a question that kind of follows up and kind of chronologically, if I can. Um, and you do a very good job looking at the late 1940s and the ways in which a variety of American intellectuals um, engaged and or appropriated uh, Locke. Um, and this may touch upon what Leslie asked about in the very beginning about the cutting room floor, what gets in the book and what doesn't get in the book. But you end chapter six um, with um, a provocative sentence. Uh, As some Americans were sending Locke to fight communism overseas, uh, dot, dot, dot. And then your interest is on the domestic side and how he's dealt with in American politics and in the American Academy. But I'm wondering the extent to which Locke was deployed overseas by American foreign policy uh, folks uh, in the context of the Cold War. And I'm just trying to imagine if he was, how this would go over in the decolonizing world. So if you have, I don't know, Lenin on the one hand and Locke on the other, it doesn't seem like much of a contest as the story unfolds. (laughs) Or am I misreading something here? Can I add a tiny bit to your question, Eric? So one of the things I noticed when I was doing, you know, my own research is that Locke's two treatises was translated for the first time into many languages right after World War II. So the first translation into Italian, for example, is right after World War II. So that that does kind of fit um, just to kind of what does this mean and how is, what is its impact is the, the, the real larger question. Yeah, exactly. And I, and I would, I, I think, you know, Eric, your question brings up the, the extent to which this sort of program, we'll say, of, of translating Locke and disseminating Locke is American rather than UK driven. And I was struck by the extent to which or the, the sort of the appearance of, of Locke and in Locke's second treatise and a letter concerning t- uh, toleration um, the sort of centrality that these played as part of the, um, uh, what is it, the you know, classics of American democracy program that sort of as Americans are sending texts uh, sort of overseas, one of the texts that they're sending um, is Locke's second treatise uh, and his letter concerning toleration. Thank you. Let me get one quick question in uh, just to uh, wrap us up. Um, Does Locke have a future um, going forward? As I think about American politics today, the extent of Americans' knowledge of American political theory, I'm guessing is kind of pretty slim. Um, Maybe this is discussed in philosophy and or political science um, seminar rooms or lecture classes, but maybe not so much. Um, But it's not clear to me that even with an emphasis on property, that Locke will resonate that strongly in Republican circles. And I can imagine that Democrats wouldn't have much use for him either. They have other people they can turn to, other traditions that they can draw upon. So has Locke, at least in American political life, uh, reached the end of the road? Uh, or is there new chapters? Are there new chapters to be written? <laughs> so <laughs> the the short answer is I, I think there are new chapters to be written. I mean, I, I'm constantly surprised by the, the the ways in which Locke still appears, say, 
in um, conversations among those on the so-called post-liberal new right who are putting forward really vehement critiques of Locke and Locke's political philosophy and engaging um, sort of conservative uh, right-leaning thinkers in a whole in a whole new way. I think um, you know to, to some of Leslie's questions and, and Holly's as well about the sort of you know the the contemporary uses of, of Locke's works, in particular an essay concerning human understanding and Locke's and thoughts concerning education. Right, we see I think new ways, new opportunities for Locke's non-political writings, or at least not sort of specifically or overtly political writings, um, to, to stage a kind of comeback. Um, and maybe I'll just end by saying, right, if, if the past is any less than, uh, you know, the moment in the sort of late 19th, early 20th century, when we see Locke teetering on the brink of obscurity, just when we think that there's no future for Locke, there's a dramatic uh, revolution and revival in how Americans and Locke's surprised if we see something uh, similar. Uh, in, in, in the year ahead. Thank you. I unfortunately have to draw this to a close and I want to express my thanks to Claire, Leslie and Holly and those of you uh, in the audience and thank you for uh, putting up with uh, our occasional sound glitches uh, um, in the seminar. I will invite you back uh, to join us on Monday the 13th of March at 4 p.m. Eastern time for the next session of the Washington History Seminar when we explore Mel Leffler's new book, Confronting Saddam Hussein, George W. Bush and the Invasion of Iraq. And Remember, this will be an in-person and online session. As I noted at the outset, for those of you in the DC area, we'd love to see you in person at the Wilson Center itself. And for those not in Washington, enjoy the hybrid option, watch online. Thank you everyone. Until next week, stay safe and good night. <laughs>